Welcome to the eighth presentation in the Doctoral Student Support Webinar Series. The title of today's chat is IRB, Friend or Foe. Before we get started, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about myself for those of you who don't know me. I've been involved with doctoral education for over 20 years. I have both a podcast and a book about the doctoral experience because what I'm really passionate about is being a part of the movement that changes the 50% dropout rate that's found across doctoral programs. Now relevant to tonight's talk, I currently serve as the IRB chair at Aspen University. The idea for this webinar came from years of work with IRBs at a number of different institutions, where I saw both students and faculty confused and even frustrated by the IRB process. So I started to do some research and I discovered that this was a common theme in many institutions. So it seems that all over the world, researchers are complaining about the IRB process. Now, because I'm on a mission to improve the experience of doctoral education, the goal of this talk is to help you have a more positive experience with the IRB. I want to be clear from the start that we are just scratching the surface of topics that are associated with an IRB with this short webinar. Nonetheless, I've got four objectives. The first is to understand what an IRB is and why they exist. The second, to understand the role of the IRB in your doctoral program. Third, to learn common pitfalls. And fourth, tips for moving through the IRB process with grace and ease. So let's start at the very beginning with the name. And I'm wondering if you know what the term IRB stands for. And if you said Institutional Review Board, you were right. Per federal regulations, an IRB is a committee of at least five people with specific qualifications. Now, IRB is a common term used, and it's a term used at Aspen, but it's important to know that such an entity may be called something different in different organizations. So I have listed here other names you may see, but this is important to know because in the materials you submit to an IRB, you will be asked if you need IRB approval from another organization. So for example, if you're proposing to do research in a hospital or a university, you may need their approval as well as the institution where you're obtaining your degree. This is important to know because when you are looking for that committee, that board at another institution, it may go by another name. For simplicity's sake in this presentation, I'm going to use the term IRB. All right, so now that we know what the letters IRB stand for and that that same entity may be called something else somewhere else, let's get into what they do. In layperson's terms, an IRB's job is to protect humans who are participating in research. And they do this by reviewing the proposed activity and confirming that the rights and welfare of human participants are protected. So in short, the goal is to protect human participants while at the same time supporting researchers who are doing work to better understand and thereby improve the human condition. Now, you might be thinking, well, of course, I wouldn't do anything to hurt anyone. So this IRB seems like an extra step. Or you might be thinking, well, I know that for my doctoral work, I'm going to be doing something that I don't think needs to be submitted to the IRB for review, like a systematic literature review. We'll talk more about these types of situations in another slide. But spoiler alert. Regardless of the type of activity you are proposing, you will submit materials to an IRB for their determination. They make the determination, not you. I got an email the other day from a student saying they had read through all the materials related to the IRB and they had determined that their project didn't need to go through this process. I repeat, you will be submitting materials to an IRB and they will be making the de determination regarding the type of oversight that your activity requires. So it turns out one of the reasons researchers complain about the IRB process is because it can bring front and center a natural tension. And the tension is this. Researchers use humans 
as an ends to a means and often don't view their research in the same way an IRB member would. So here's an example. Say you have a doctoral candidate interested in how people cope after a natural disaster, and he wants to interview people who've experienced this type of event and were diagnosed with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, you can imagine that this research, if done well, could lead to many benefits for future disaster victims. But there are clearly risks involved when you ask people to relive a trauma, and that would require safeguards. So the IRB is there to ensure such safeguards are in place. Now, again, you might be thinking, well, of course, any research I design would have appropriate safeguards in place. I mean, I'm an ethical person, I'm a kind person, and my committee is made of, of people who know what they're doing. So does this really need to be regulated by an outside board? And to that question, I say, hmm, that is a great question. Let's spend just a few moments reflecting on history. The need for regulation stems from historical events, in particular, human experimentation that occurred during World War II. I'm sure that rings a bell for everyone. Now, the Nuremberg Code that followed covered issues like requiring voluntary participation, the need for consent, um, making sure everyone was aware of and had a full understanding of the costs and benefits of the research, requiring qualified experimenters with relevant research designs, et cetera, et cetera. So it sounds pretty comprehensive, this Nuremberg Code that came out in 1947. But even with that, unethical research programs continued. And here you see a list. And in each of these studies, investigators were confident that the ends of the research justified the means. And that is why a third party who is trained in protecting the rights and welfare of human participants reviews research activity before it commences. Now, the list here is just a few of examples, and these are the ones that we know of. Now, it was the last one listed here that led to the Belmont Report and the Common Rule, which is simply a rule of ethics, and the federal mandate for the existence of IRBs for regulated research. Now, while many doctoral dissertations or doc projects are not regulated, and what that means is they are not funded by specific governmental agencies, most academic institutions do have policy that all research conducted at that institution follows the same or even more conservative guidelines. The Belmont Report was written in response to the infamous Tuskegee syphilis study. And this is a study, again, you've probably heard of this, where African Americans with syphilis were lied to and denied treatment for more than 40 years. As you can imagine, many people died as a result. They infected others with the disease and they passed congenital syphilis on to their children. So following this study, the government got involved. They created a commission and the result was the Belmont Report. This report summarizes the three ethical principles the commission concluded should guide human research. These are listed here, and they include respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. The Belmont Report led to the common rule. What's the common rule, you may ask? Well, it's the short name for the Federal Policy for the Protection of Human Subjects, and it was adopted by a number of federal agencies in 1991. The common rule, and you're going to hear this term a lot, especially when you're going through your CITI training or whatever training regarding human protections your university may require, the common rule is essentially the baseline standard of ethics by which any government-funded research in the U.S. is held. Now, again, I want to remind you, nearly all U.S. academic institutions hold their researchers to the common rule regardless of funding source. Now, it's important to understand that there are federal regulations, and then there are institutional policies, state, and local regulations that may come into play with your doctoral research activity. So what this means is that you may design, or at some point in the future, be part of a team that designs a research study that balances all three of those pillars, those principles I talked about with the common rule. And you could gain IRB approval 
but the institution or organization where you want to do this work may not allow it. So for example, it's quite common in my experience that online institutions don't allow certain types of activity simply as a matter of policy. So for example, studies that require participants to ingest something or be injected with something, things of that nature. Now we'll talk about how to avoid pitfalls of designing something that won't be approved a little bit later. Okay, let's pause here and do a quick recap. Objective number one was to understand what an IRB is and why they exist. And the takeaway here is that an IRB is an independent board that reviews research to make sure no one is harming human subjects. So in this sense, I invite you to think of the IRB as a partner in your research endeavor. They really are there to help you. Okay, now we're going to get into some nuts and bolts. And I know this slide is super dense, but just sit back and relax and let me walk you through it. We're gonna go through this together. Now, what happens when you submit materials to an IRB is that an IRB administrator will use a formal process that's based on that common rule, right? That baseline standard of ethics to determine what happens with your IRB submission. And I wanna note that what I'm showing you here is a very basic and general flowchart that uses the federal regulations as a baseline. And it's important to remember that each institution, each organization could have additional policies and procedures. So for example, at the recording of this webinar, Aspen University is using a more conservative approach. However, we are currently revising the IRB process to align it more closely to the chart that you see here. All right, so you submit your materials and the administrator reviewing them is going to ask a series of questions in a very specific order. So the first question that's asked right here is, is it research? So let me give you the definition of research because you might think that that's a very simple question to answer, but it's not. It's actually not black and white. So think about your proposed activity if you're that far along in your program and ask yourself, is this an activity that involves a prospective plan that incorporates data collection and data analysis to answer a question? And often the answer to that is yes. However, there's another consideration, and that consideration is related to generalizable knowledge. Now, generalizable knowledge is information where the intended use of these research findings is that they can be applied to populations or situations beyond those that you're studying. So the question here becomes, is your activity designed to develop or contribute to generalizable knowledge, draw conclusions, or generalize findings beyond a single unit, like a specific organization or a program? And if the answer is no, the process will stop there because it's not considered research. Now, an example could be some policy development studies or some QI studies. So for those of you in the DMP program, it's possible that what you are proposing actually isn't research and you would stop there. Your materials, I should say, would stop there. But let's say you answer yes, because for a lot of doctoral students, they are conducting research. So let's move on to the next question. Is it human subjects? And again, you might think that this is an easy question to answer, but look at how long that definition is. Let me give you an example of research that isn't human subjects. A systematic literature review. That is a research activity where you are using data in the form of already published studies. So if your answer is no there, again, the materials stop and there's a determination of not human subjects research. Now, the majority of doctoral projects and dissertations for most programs outside of a DMP fall into this third category here where we ask the question, is it exempt? Now, for a study to be exempt, it must be minimal risk. And what, is, what do we mean by minimal risk? Basically, that the study wouldn't be expected to cause any sort of harm beyond what would happen to you in daily life. In addition to being minimal risk, it has to fit in one of eight categories. Now, I want to pause for a minute and talk about this word exempt because sometimes people will say things to me like, well, my study's exempt 
So it's exempt from having to be reviewed by the IRB. Remember, as a doctoral candidate, you're going to be submitting materials to a third party at Aspen University, it's called an IRB, to review this activity before this activity commences. That's part of a doctoral program. It's built into the program. So exempt does not mean you're exempt from submitting an IRB application or an IRB review form. Exempt means simply this, that it's exempt from some of the federal regulations. However, these studies are not exempt from state laws, institutional policies, or the requirement for the conduct of ethical research. So if the research is exempt, it's going to stop there, all right, after it's been reviewed and that determination has made. However, if it's not minimal risk or it doesn't fit into one of those eight categories, it goes on to be reviewed as either expedited or a full board review. Now, most doctoral dissertations and doctoral projects especially at Aspen University, don't go on for expedited or full board review. Some examples would be a study that is more than minimal risk or that targets a vulnerable population, we'll talk about this in a little bit, or collects sensitive information that could potentially cause harm to the participant in terms of reputation, employability, things of that nature. If it goes on to a full board review, this can be very lengthy. So if we remember that a doctoral project or dissertation is simply a demonstration project and not your life's work, it really makes sense that in general, doctoral students are encouraged to design activities that don't require a full board review. All right. So I know that was a lot of information. Take a deep breath and remember, you don't need to know the details of this chart. This chart was presented so that you understand the IRB process, that you understand what this board is doing, and to kind of pull back that curtain a little bit so that you can get a sneak peek as to what's happening behind the scenes and maybe have a little bit better of an understanding of the process, but also take some of this information in, in terms of designing your activity and what that might mean for you and your program. Okay, so if I haven't put you to sleep yet, I have a question for you. And that question is, who gets to decide the answers to these questions? Is it research? Is it human subjects research? Is it exempt? Is it eligible for expedited review? And the answer is an IRB administrator. It is not you as the investigator, your chair, your committee member, any other faculty members. Remember, regardless of where you think your doctoral activity fits, whether you're doing a dissertation or a doctoral project, that determination is made by an IRB administrator. To approve your research, the IRB must determine a number of things, things like that the risks are minimized, that the ratio of the risk to the benefits is reasonable, that informed consent is being sought, that you've got plans for monitoring the data, You've got a plan to protect privacy and when appropriate safeguards are in place to protect the participants. Let's turn to some pain points. Now, it's common that candidates don't realize that a study designed to target a vulnerable population or sometimes a, called a protected population will require additional safeguards and sometimes a higher level of oversight. And here is where that fresh set of eyes that the IRB brings to the table will help make sure your research doesn't unintentionally place someone at risk. So I've listed here some common vulnerable populations. In general, a vulnerable population is any group that needs special considerations or protections given the research topic. So for example, if you're targeting people with impaired decision-making, the IRB will make sure that the consent process is appropriate. Or if you're asking about sensitive information, they're going to ensure a safe place for interviews. So for example, it's unlikely that an IRB would allow you to conduct interviews about sexual behavior at your local coffee shop. Let's reflect back to that example I gave earlier with the candidate who wanted to interview people who had PTSD who had lived through a natural disaster. The IRB would want to make sure that resources were available, 
if that research could cause risk or harm beyond what would be expected in daily life. And I think that probably makes sense to everyone, right? Now, another area where fresh IRB eyes can be really helpful is in the area of coercion or undue influence. So for example, asking your students or employees who are subordinate to you to take part in your study. Why? Because they may feel like they actually don't have a choice, right? If you're asking them to do this, they may feel like they have to say yes. And that violates that pillar, that principle of respect for persons. Also giving rewards for completing a study that may drive the decision to participate. So for example, I was once involved in an IRB quite a long time ago when the iPod first came out and the candidate wanted to do a survey in a school and have everyone who participated in that survey be entered into a lottery for an iPod. And this school happened to be in a very impoverished neighborhood and the IRB made the decision that that was an inappropriate incentive because it was essentially taking away the student's uh, ability to really choose whether or not they did want to be a part of this study. So in short, the incentive was so great, it kind of took away that voluntary aspect. Let's pause and recap objective two to understand the role of the IRB in your program. In short, IRBs bring a fresh set of eyes cross-checking your biases in order to protect human subjects. Now let's move on to some practical advice regarding the design of your doctoral capstone activity and the submission of your IRB materials. So these are things to avoid. Not understanding your institutional policy. I already mentioned that this presentation is really focused on giving you a baseline understanding of federal regulations but you want to understand your institution's policies in addition to these, and those will often be available in an IRB handbook. Another pitfall is not using resources that your university provides you like templates. So really not a week goes by where I don't see materials submitted where someone didn't use the template. And so guess what? That means something's missing and I have to send it back and ask for a revision. Not planning ahead can be a pitfall, especially if you're targeting vulnerable populations and not justifying in your materials risks that are anticipated that are above minimal or the use of vulnerable populations. So what I mean by this is absolutely research is approved all day long for studies that target vulnerable populations and that have anticipated risks that are above minimal. However, Your IRB materials need to do a really good job of justifying why this research has these risks and why this research is using this population. Another pitfall is promising things you can't promise. So do not promise that a survey will be anonymous when that is in this day and age almost impossible to guarantee. Online surveys can be tied to IP addresses, things of that nature. Also guaranteeing confidentiality. An example here might be a focus group. If you're going to lead a focus group, you cannot guarantee that what happens in that group is staying in that group. So what do you do? You make sure the consent form says things like, by agreeing to be in this research study, you agree to not disclose the information that was discussed. Um, But you also understand that the researcher can't prevent that from happening, right? So you're just candid with your research subjects. You also can't promise that there is zero risk. Being a human and participating in any activity will have some sort of risk. Remember, we're looking to see if your study, when we're making a decision about what type of oversight it needs, is whether or not it's minimal risk. And if we remember that definition of minimal risk, it's the probability of harm or discomfort that would be no greater than that that you would expect in daily life. Inappropriate compensation or incentives, we talked about that. And this one is really straightforward, submitting incomplete or problematic IRB materials. So things that are commonly seen are items skipped on an application or review form supplemental documents not included, 
permissions not secured. So if you're working again in a clinic or a school, you often need permission to do the research there. And the IRB at Aspen or wherever you're getting your doctoral degree will want to see that you've secured those permissions. The permission might even be permission to post in a private Facebook group or LinkedIn group. And also making sure that everything is aligned. So Sometimes I see something on an application where it's talking about an online survey, but then later in the application, they're talking about a focus group. And so the IRB administrator needs to make sense of your application. It needs to be aligned. You need to tell them exactly what you're doing and how you're doing it. And if there are any inconsistencies, it's going to cause a delay. Now, let me give you some tips about things that you should do. Think about the IRB early, especially if you're targeting vulnerable populations. One way to do this is to reach out to the IRB, let them know what you're planning on doing, and ask their advice. Be diligent with your CIT training or whatever human subjects protection training your institution may require. Take notes. There will be quizzes. You have to pass the quizzes to get the certification. And you need the certification in order to submit your IRB materials. Now, if you're wondering, well, wait, where do I find this training? You'll be prompted in the appropriate class to create an account and do that training. So you don't need to worry about that. Read all your university resources. I mentioned, you know, planning early, especially if you're targeting vulnerable populations. Things like your IRB handbook often has detailed steps and things that you need to know to make it easier for you if that's the route that you're going. Please use templates if your university provides them. Again, it will save you from someone coming back to you and saying you're missing some information. Proofread your submission, double yes, even triple check that everything is complete and aligned, that you're clear about the consent process, not just that you've attach an informed consent form, but that you've explained how informed consent is being obtained. Don't say the data will be protected. Explain how it's going to be protected. And be sure to include your inclusion and your exclusion criteria for the participants because we need to understand who is and who isn't going to be in your study. Again, these are all questions that will be on your IRB application or your IRB review form, you just want to be sure that you're answering them comprehensively. Some more things to do. Include all likely recruitment processes to avoid having to submit a change request. What do I mean by this? Recently, I have seen, and I don't know if this is related to COVID or what, but candidates will propose to recruit people from one group like one LinkedIn group, one Facebook group, or I'm going to post a request for participants on my Instagram account. I'm going to hang up this flyer in this one location. And the IRB gives approval for that one thing. And then they don't get the participants through that avenue and they have to expand. And then they have to go back to the IRB and say, okay, well, you gave me permission to post in this specific LinkedIn group, but now I want to go to Facebook, or now I want to go to this conference. And you have to go back and ask for additional approval. So the advice here is to think about diversifying and not putting all your eggs in one basket. Understand that the issues related to the use of human participants in research is complex. Probably the short webinar has given you a glimpse into that. You're probably thinking you're glad you're not on an IRB right now. Um, but IRBs are made up of humans and interpretations can vary. So you may be at an organization or an institution that deems what you're doing as not research, whereas somewhere else they could consider it exempt research right? Or it might be considered exempt at one place, but at another place, they could require an expedited or a full review. So just understand that as you're going through this process. See any requests that you get for modifications as a good thing, because remember the IRB is there to help you make sure that your research is not unintentionally harming anyone. And I know everyone on this call has that goal. Follow your institutional policy regarding any changes you need to make, reporting unexpected events, or if you need continuing review that goes beyond the date that you were approved for. All these types of policies and how to go about these things will be in your IRB handbook. 
So just make sure you do review that. And when in doubt, ask questions because remember, the IRB is there to partner with you in your research. So let's do a recap of objectives three and four. You learned some of the common pitfalls, things not to do, along with some things to do so that you can move through this process with grace and ease. I'm recording this after the live webinar because there was an issue with the audio, but the question and answer period really was focused on queries related to how do you get IRBs to work together and which one comes first. I know that I'm doing research at University X, and I know that they require IRB approval, but I'm getting my doctorate at Aspen University. So what comes first? And the answer to that was, it really depends. And so again, that tip of getting the IRB involved and seeing them as your partner, reach out. If you're a student at Aspen, the email is irb at aspen.edu and let the IRB help you work through and navigate this process of obtaining appropriate permissions and approvals. I wanna make sure that you know the next webinar is taking place on September 21st at 4 p.m. Pacific time where Dr. Robinson will give a talk called Get the Ducks in a Row, Systematic Note-Taking for Analysis and Synthesis. If you haven't started your chapter two yet, or you're in the process of writing your chapter two, you absolutely do not want to miss this talk that will help you wrap your mind around how is it that you're going to read hundreds of articles and distill that information and articulate it in a way that makes sense for your committee. And if you can't wait, because maybe right now you're in the middle of chapter two, feel free to listen to the Happy Doc Student Podcast episode 57 or watch it on the YouTube channel. It's a game changer, systematic note-taking with Dr. Jennifer Robinson. And again, I want to remind you to follow either Aspen or USU on social media so that you can be informed about more webinars, workshops, and talks just like this one. Thanks so much, and I look forward to seeing you on the next webinar.